Hello everyone and welcome to episode number two of the CNC Base Camp, a show that's all about helping you get the most out of your CNC router. Well, whether you're a woodworker, a model builder, or a maker, one thing we all spend a lot of time with is how to join parts together, particularly wooden parts. So today's show is all about joinery of plywood and solid wood using your CNC router. So I've got a lot of samples here of different joints I'd like to show you. And the first round of joints are going to be ones which you cut exclusively with your CNC router. The second round, we're going to add a handheld router to give us a few more options. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com. So let's start with joints that are, are cut specifically with a CNC router. The first one is a very simple tongue and groove joint. Now if you're a woodworker, you know all about that. On one end, we're going to have a tongue. On the other end, a simple groove. And together, the two make a very versatile and a pretty strong joint. It's good for cabinetry, it's great for drawers. It does have a little weakness though. If enough stress is applied to the joint, this little end here of wood can sometimes fracture and break. So we have to know its limitations. A second joint, which offers a little more strength and a great deal of convenience, is the blind tenon joint. On this end, you'll see the tenons. And here we have the mortises. They're blind because they don't go all the way through the material. One thing you'll notice on my tenons is that the, there's this slight fillet at the root. That fillet is because our router bit can't cut into a 90 degree corner and that's always a challenge we have with CNC joinery. So, to deal with that, I've made my mortises somewhat wider than my tenons, and that way there's plenty of room for that fillet. The blind mortise and tenon joint is strong, it's simple, and it's surprisingly easy to make for casework and for drawers. So if you have a whole lot of kitchen cabinets to make or a commercial cabinet job, it's really a great joint and you'll do it all at your CNC router. Another joint that's a little more specialized but occasionally is useful is what I'm calling the step joint. The step joint looks the same on both ends of the parts. It's a simple set of stair steps. Well, what does that do for us? Well, if you think about a miter joint, miters are always inherently a little weak, but with a stair step joint, you get almost 35% more gluing area. The gluing area has a mechanical advantage in all these steps, and it's really a very handy, self-registering joint in certain applications. Next up, let's talk a little bit about dealing with the problem of that filleted area that the router bit can't reach. There's a couple solutions to that. Let me show you three that are pretty easy and then we'll move on to another set of joints where we're going to add an additional tool, a handheld router, that'll help us out. If you look at this joint here, it's a simple box joint. Nothing fancy about that, but what we've had to do is cut out the material to allow clearance we're going to cut out the fillet that the router can't reach. This particular version is called a dog bone, well, because it looks like milk bone. So it's easy to make, but there are a couple issues with it. One is visually, it's not very agreeable. It's a little rough looking. Two, the router actually has to stop its momentum, change directions, cut that hole, change directions again, and then move over to the other side where it repeats. And so we're losing a certain smoothness to the action of our CNC router when we employ a dog bone. Another variation, which is pretty useful, is called a T-bone. 
And so in this case, the clearance is cut to the side of the joint rather than the side and below it. Now here's one advantage. If you'll notice on the interior, it's a fairly clean line. Let me pull up that dog bone again. Let's take a look at that. Ah, you'll see that. We're seeing part of the holes from the cutouts. But with the T-bone, it's gone. Another advantage of the T-bone is that we've reduced the amount of momentum changes that the router has to make. It basically will stop at the beginning of the hole, go around the hole, move to the next side, stop, and then come clean out. So there's really only two changes. Another form of these clearance joints is one that I found in a book on making CNC furniture from Maker Media. And they call this a sniglet. It's kind of an interesting joint. If you look at it closely, you'll see that rather than having the router come to a complete stop, there's actually a smooth transition so that the router never completely stops. It just simply goes straight from the side of the finger to the hole, to the cutout, which allows the clearance, moves to the other side, and sweeps back. And that may seem like a very small thing, but if we're cutting a large sheet of plywood and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these clearance cuts to make, it'll help. The last joint I'd like to show you is one that's called the blind box joint. So it's a box joint, much as the ones we just looked at, with fingers that interlock. Very strong, very solid, but it has the advantage that it's hidden, so it's an exceptionally clean joint. If you'll notice, there's only one small line here. Other than that, clean faces. So let's take a look at how that's made. If we look at one side of our joint, you can see the fingers for a traditional box joint. You can also see the T-bone cutouts for our clearance for the fillet. But you'll also notice that rather than cutting the fingers all the way through, there's a little coverlet of wood that's been left here. And that little coverlet is what makes it such a clean looking joint. The other side is the same, except that I have a small tab of the same thickness of our coverlet, so that when the two come together and marry, we get this nice clean edge. It's strong, it's modern looking, it's fresh, it is a great joint and one you should really consider using. Well, that's a sampling of joints which use just your CNC machine. All these were cut with a quarter inch router bit. Now let's talk about creating some joinery with the aid of a router. The router bit that I have in this router is a small 1 8 inch roundover solid pilot router bit. There's a couple of manufacturers that make these. This has a brass sheathing on the tip. The brass has a much better lubricity than plain carbide, so less burning. These are available in several sizes. An eighth inch roundover bit works as a companion to a quarter inch router bit. A sixteenth roundover would be a companion for an eighth inch straight router bit. So let's think about some of the joints we can create using that bit. Now what I have here are some parts for a through tenon, a very common joint in woodworking. But as you can see here, it's pretty much of a square peg in a round hole right now. I've got the round fillets on the mortises, I've got a square ends on these tenons. But with the router, it'll just take a moment and it'll fit together. Look at that. Now we've got a good fitting through tenon joint. And so we can apply the same idea of using that round over to box joints as well. So take a look at this. This is a half round box joint. I made it using my CNC machine and this eighth inch router bit. 
Good looking joint outside, clean on the inside. That's a winner. We could also do a couple other variations of it. This joint here, I've simply taken my router bit and I've rounded over the additional edges. And it creates sort of a, a bony look to the joint, which I really like. For you green and green fans, take a look at this. I've extended the pins out, made them much wider. And if you'd like, you can also use your router to cut a shallow hole to mark the location of where you would put a square peg. So you'd use a square hollow chisel to create the recess for the square peg. So there you have it. The through tenon and three great variations in a box joint, all using the eight inch round over bed. So I've got a quick CNC tip for you. How do we cut joinery on the ends of panels that are bigger than the format size of our machine? Well, of course, tiling is one option, if you have that option with your CAM program. But here's another. I've got a panel here that's much larger than my machine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and have my CNC lightly ghost the image of the box joint that I would like to be cut on the end of my panel. Along with ghosting the image of the pins of my box joint, it's also going to ghost the image of a little bit of my side here. Once that's done, I can set a fence to register the side of my panel, and I'm going to set a fence to register where the pins are to be cut along the length of my part. I've purposely added an extra inch and a half to each end of my panel. With those fences in place, I can go ahead and have the machine cut not the entire profile of my side, since it's too big for the format, but just the box joint alone. That way, my CNC router becomes a joint cutting machine for any size part as long as it can fit under the gantry. If you do a lot of cabinetry in your workshop, then you know the value of a good mortising machine. Well, you've got a good mortising machine in your CNC router. Let me show you how. The first step I'm going to do is I'm going to let the router cut a light ghost image of a reference for a fence and the position of the mortise that I'd like to cut. Well, as you can see here, I have a fence screwed down into the pocket created by my machine, so I know this fence is accurately set. I also have placed a stop for the distance the mortise will be from the end of my workpiece. So, to set my workpiece against the fence, clamped in place, I'm ready to go. Well, it's time for our project today. I think you're going to like it. What it is is a small tool chest that would be perfect for equipping your digital workshop. Good place for all those router bits, wrenches, clamps, and so forth. Now, the project can be built entirely on a desktop CNC, so no part is going to go beyond 24 inches. And also, we're going to employ some of the joinery that we learned about earlier. So let's take a look at it. Now, as you can see, I'm using half round box joints that we talked about earlier. And I've decided to go ahead and let the joints extend a little bit past the sides. So the fingers are long on the top and on the bottom. And that gives it kind of a nice toothy look, adds a little texture to things, which I really like. It has three drawers, which go from shallow to a little deeper, and the drawers have about nine inches or so of depth on the inside, so there's plenty of room for your router bits, wrenches, and all sorts of different items. The joinery of the drawers is very simple and straightforward, and was chosen so that we will only be routing on one side of the parts. Now, two-sided routing is not hard, but we're going to save that for another day. Also, the toolbox is placed on two feet and there's an arch cut in the bottom of the feet, and that gives it a nice loft. It's a simple project to assemble, but it's very strong, 
very practical, and I think it'll be a great addition to your digital workshop. Well, now it's time for us to go ahead and glue up our toolbox. I'm going to start with the bottom, sides, top, and back. Now, with these half-round box joints, we need to be a little bit careful in the application of glue so that we don't get too much squeeze out. And that's because they're a little hard to clean out with the tails extending a little bit beyond the sides. So I'm just going to put a little bit of glue down in the root of each of these and spread it just a little ways up onto the side of the pins. Because I don't want to go too high since some of that is actually exposed. Now's a good time to go ahead and insert the back. Now I'm using a standard yellow glue. This is a great all-around shop glue, but there are slower setting glues available. And there's nothing wrong with using a slow setting glue to make the glue up a little less frantic. Now whenever we clamp up an exposed joint like this, it's important that we use a call and set it right behind the joint line because we don't want to be clamping on the joint itself or it's not going to pull tight. So I'm going to start just by very lightly clamping across the top and the bottom. And now I'll start to clamp across the two ends. I want to make sure we check for square. pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten my clamps up just a little bit more. I don't want to overdo it too much because since the clamps are sitting inbound of the joinery, I can easily bow in the long sides of my project. So I just want to make sure everything is snug. It seems to be. And now we just need to let the glue dry and we're going to move on to assembling a drawer. Well, let me show you a little bit about the construction of the drawers. What I have here are the parts for the middle drawer. Now, the back has a simple rabbet for the bottom and two plows. The plows fit into this groove on the sides. The front has a rabbet along the bottom and it's a little deeper than the back and it's deeper because I need this tab here to cover up the height of the plywood guides that the drawer is going to slide in and out on. Let me flip this over and you can see that the bottom is going to glue in to these rabbits and the bottom will glue directly to the bottom of our sides. It's a simple way of making a drawer and it's one that allows us to cut only on one side of each part and that makes it just a little bit easier to machine. So looks like I need to grab a glue bottle and some clamps and glue up some drawers. Well, here's our completed tool chest, and I think it really turned out sharp. I really love these half round box joints that extend out a little bit. They give it a sort of toothy, bony look to it, which I think really is appropriate for a toolbox. I want you to take a look at the two feet that we have underneath here, help kind of loft the toolbox up. And here's our drawers. Lots of storage space, strong drawers. You can take them out to your machines or wherever you're going to. One thing I'd like you to think about is some different variations on the toolbox. As an example, instead of drawers, you could have a pair of doors up front. Or what I'd like to see is a toolbox with the same joinery that's tall, narrow, still on these feet, and is filled full of small drawers. I think it'd look great. So a combination of different versions of this toolbox, you could have one sharp digital workshop. 
So of course, the plans for this tool chest are downloadable and you'll find them on our website. I hope you'll build it, and if you do, send me a picture. Love to see it. Well, now it's time for our question, answer, and comment section. So I wanted to pass on a little story about an episode I had recently with this machine. This machine has worked flawlessly for me, and so has its other predecessors for a couple of years now. But recently I was using it, and it would hesitate a little bit. It would travel five, six inches, hesitate for about half a second, and it kept doing that. It didn't lose any steps. It was cutting fine, but it was acting a little irrational. So I thought, well, what's the problem here? I swapped out computers because I have another PC with Mach 3 on it. Same thing kept happening. I swapped out routers because this router is on its third set of brushes and I was a little concerned there might be some arcing in the armature. Still no change. And then I took the hose from the dust collection system off. Everything cleaned up and it operated normally. Well, here's what I figured out. I hadn't had this problem before because recently we've had some very cryogenically cold weather here in Iowa and the heated air inside this building was bone dry and so it was very conductive. My dust collection system, yeah, it's grounded. I've got a braided copper cable running inside the hose. But here's the problem. These cables that connect the Z-axis stepper and the Y-axis stepper motor are high-duty cycle cables, but they're not shielded. So what was happening was I was getting a massive amount of electromagnetic interference from my dust collector into these cables and it was confusing the electronics of my machine. So, moral of this story is if you have a purchased CNC machine or a home-built CNC machine, you make sure and ground that dust collection system out thoroughly. And if you're a home builder, get shielded cabling. That's what I'm going to do for this machine and for the next one I'm building. Hey, one question that I get at least once a month is how large can I make the Woodsmith CNC machine? Can I make it bigger? Well, the answer is you can and you can't. It's not that hard to make the machine longer. The x-axis is driven by a five-thread, two-pitch lead screw, and that's available in eight-foot lengths. So there's really no reason why we can't stretch the machine out to use the full length of an eight-foot piece of lead screw, and that should give you a easily six and a half feet, maybe up to seven, of format cutting area. The only problem when we start extending out that far is the lead screw is only supported at the stepper motor, at its support bearing on the end, and at the anti-backlash nut underneath our gantry. So when the gantry is far to the right or to the left, it's a pretty long amount of lead screw that's unsupported, and it will tend to sag just a little bit. And of course, as it rotates, if we rotate it quickly, it may tend to act like a jump rope and cause some vibration. It probably won't be too much of a problem because that lead screw, because it's fast acting, is never really going to go over 200 RPM very much. But it's something to think about. As far as expanding in terms of width, well, that carries a bit of a problem. One of the issues we always have in designing a CNC machine is racking of the gantry, having it go out of square relative to the table and the rails. In order to prevent it from racking, I've got some fairly wide connection points to the sides and underneath of the machine, as well as some very solid connection points up here. Also, the bearings are spaced fairly wide on my sides, and that helps keep things running true. But it is still piloted by that single Acme thread underneath. If we really want to expand the machine in width, we would have to use two lead screws. It would be the same arrangement, a motor and anti-backlash nut and the lead screw, but they'd need to be far apart on either side, and that will prevent the racking. Not hard to do. It adds a few complications. We'll need the additional stepper motor. Each stepper motor requires its own driver, and if we add another big gantry motor, we're definitely going to need some more power in the way of at least one more 
transformer. Probably two. One for each of the two primary X-drive stepper motors and one to handle the Z and the Y axis. So, I think it's fun to think about. I'd love to give it a try. And uh, if you make one of these that's bigger, send me a picture. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com.